I'm Carl Ulrich, Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Wharton School, and I'm very lucky to be able to interview today Iqbal Kadir, who's the founder of two amazing institutions, Grameen Phone and the Legatum Center at MIT. Welcome, Iqbal. Thank you very much. Great to be here. You know, I want to take us back to your origins. Tell, tell us a little bit about where you came from. I, I came from Bangladesh, but uh, I came from a relatively smaller town called Jessore. And uh, I grew up there, and I happened to have gone to a boarding school inside Bangladesh. But um, um, since you're asking, the, what has impacted on me, which I guess we could come to, is uh, that uh, one year of my life, I was somewhat of an urban uh, kid. Uh, but in 1971, when there was a war in the country, I went to the rural area for uh, my family did. And um, we, I had experienced the actual rural conditions in Bangladesh during that year. So I, my friends were often uh, children of peasants and other small farmers. And that had always had an impact on me. And uh, so that's, I, uh, I talk about that, yeah. And how did you end up in the United States? Um, I guess I was an entrepreneur, <laughs> I, I don't know. But uh, my father died when I was 14 years old. And I somehow aspired to get a good education. And I, my mother and, uh, had provided some funds, but I managed to get to the US with some scholarships. And eventually I got uh, better and almost full scholarship. And uh, so that's how I simply tried myself. Yeah, yeah. that's a... That's a common path for some of our most successful entrepreneurs in the United States. <laughs> and, and so you, you, there, there are a lot of others who've taken that path. And, and like the, many of those others, you also achieved some entrepreneurial success. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about Grameen Phone. Sure. Uh, Grameen Phone right now is the largest company in the country uh, in Bangladesh. And it has 55 million subscribers. Sometimes in the stock market, it's valued some $7 billion. But uh, if I go back, it was really uh, for four or five years, I tried to convince people that this is a good idea. This is something to be pursued. And it took quite a while to convince that. But I think if we want to go back to its origin, uh, it's good that you asked me about my personal origin. Uh, those impacts had certain... Uh, germ of thoughts that eventually gave rise to uh, a Grameen phone. And, um, and this is why I think it's important that no matter how we rigorously we think about problems, uh, deeper at a deeper level, passions are important because it drives us to find a logical solution. But uh, even behind logic, you may have uh, a passionate uh, pursuit which gives rise to finding a logical solution. So in my case, I knew that I came to America and there were extraordinary opportunities here uh, in the United States. I managed to go to good schools with scholarships and whatnot. But I uh, also had in mind the conditions I've seen in Bangladesh. And so therefore, I always on the lookout for uh, good ideas that could do something about it. So two really important ideas have stuck me in that I was doing that. One is that um, the economic progress does not necessarily come from uh, pouring capital into it or something, but rather people becoming more efficient uh, in managing their tasks or getting better at it. So it's a question of improvements or, or, or skills, but also how uh, let's say, in a sense, economic progress can come out of thin air. I, I, I'll give you that point. Um, so for instance, I was actually attracted to Adam Smith because he mentioned uh, Bengal, which is Bangladesh. Two-thirds of Bengal is Bangladesh. That is how I was originally drawn to it. And he mentioned an interesting thing. He said in antiquity, three places had good... Um, um, good wealth, and they were ancient Egypt, Bengal, and eastern China. And he attributed those things to uh, inland navigation. 
And his point is that people could exchange and through inland navigation, um, specialize in exchange and divide in division of labor. And through that, wealth is created. And through that, uh, there was, a op he called it opulence mm -hmm. in antiquity. Mm -hmm. And that has drawn me, and that I, as a result, I always became a fan of Adam Smith. But what is interesting is that many things come out of division of labor, many good things, okay, including inclusivity. Because if I want to specialize in something, I have to give up something else to you, okay? So that gives rise to inclusivity. Now, but what is interesting of all of that is that <clears throat> it's, uh, it's something I learned over time. I frankly didn't grasp it all over uh, immediately. But, uh, but I did see the inland navigation as a means of communication that naturally certain places had, certain other places didn't have, okay? But separately, I had another, I'll come back to the another Adam Smith point. But separately, I had another uh, important thing I observed is when I was an undergraduate, I was part of a uh, college team. I mean, I was the only token student representative in this team that decided on buying a $3 million computer, okay? and one big mainframe that took a whole room full of machinery. And then in the, when I was doing my graduate studies here at Wharton, okay, I was in decision sciences with computers. We learned all sorts of applications of computers. But the key point is there's this Moore's law that's driving down costs and processing power is getting squeezed more and more into the same chips. But the Moore's law means the prices of this processing power is declining rapidly, which means countries that doesn't have very much capital, these machines are going towards them. Okay, so I actually tried in the middle of 80s with another brother of mine. We created a Bengali word processor. Okay, ah. but later on we realized that uh, that it was an interesting innovation to take. But I'm trying to show you the evolution of this. That um, the Bengali word processor people couldn't use, at least not, not the masses, because um, it's a um, most people do not know how to read or write. Okay. But an event took place in my life in the 93. By this time, I've been trying to be a budding investment banker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the point is that um, I, I noticed that uh, we, I was to work in a, a small firm that had, um, uh, we just had some rudimentary networks. So we didn't have to exchange floppy disk and cumbersome activities. So we could send data from one to another, et cetera. And one time it broke down and I was waiting for someone to come and fix it. But that reminded me of a day in 1971, 22 years earlier. This is in 93 or so. And uh, I um, remember my mother sent me to get some medicine from this rural setting. And uh, I was from a middle class family. My father was a lawyer and all these things. But uh, in this setting, I walked 10 kilometers to get this medicine. And when I went there, the medicine man wasn't there. So I walked all afternoon back. And as a result, I remembered that unproductive day sitting in New York while having, waiting for someone to come and fix my network and kind of said, you know, networks help. So if you are connected, you can get things done. And if you don't get connected, then you don't get things done. So this inland navigation earlier in my mind, I went back to all those things. And I realized a new thing, which is that Two things. One is the microchips are getting uh, squeezed in, into phones in the early 90s. They were becoming digital phones. Before that, cellular phones were analog phones. But at this point, I also realized a powerful point from Adam Smith, that there were many things that come out of division of labor, and division of labor gives rise to productivity. So just like I experienced that if I had connections, I could produce more and perhaps pay for the phone service. Similarly, this is confirmed by the, one of the most profound economies, okay, that the, the, it will promote division of labor if we can connect with each other. Otherwise, I cannot really divide and do a, one part and you do another part, we can exchange. But what he made also, he said, the market, the extent of the market, dip, uh, dip tells you how far you would be dividing. So let's say I start focusing on fishing, but I will stop there and not necessarily go any further and fishing only salmons, okay, if the market is small. Okay. If the market is bigger and bigger, 
then I can uh, specialize narrower and narrower. But that means, and all the other good things come out of this division of labor, okay? But if we did that, then other means of connectivity profoundly impacts on the mar size of the market. So the point is, the, the ways to connect determines how far the market will be and how far the division of labor will advance. And all of this made sense to me. So ultimately I realized that if the, the Moore's law is bringing down the price of connectivity, connectivity would be a profound force of, of transforming these countries. And it became so, I became so convinced of this because of these insights of these other people. I'm basically stealing their ideas. Mm -hmm. I basically said, hey, I have to stay put on this. So I stayed <laughs> for five, six years convincing various parties to come together and create this company. Uh, I jokingly say that that's how I lost my hair. <laughs> uh, now, it, it's, it's amazing because you're really saying not only does private enterprise and entrepreneurship contribute yes. to a, an economy, but particular kinds of innovations, these connectivity innovations. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit like this. You see, I, I, I like analogies to understand what's happening. Let's say if I take a bucket of water, if I drop a, a drop of ink, even without stirring, it will get absorbed. And so if it is something favorable, the molecules, other molecules will receive them. So in other words, people will accept them. But if you put a, let's say, a drop of water, uh, oil, it may not go very far, okay? So if you find the right technology, then it will be grabbed by people, okay? And the whole water will get transformed, okay? That the whole economy gets transformed. So the, I think the cell phone was such a thing because it's fundamentally, a, a, elementally human to connect and, and produce more and gain more. Sometimes it's consumption. I want to contact my friends and see how it is doing. But sometimes it's production. Namely, I want to save time and produce more, etc. So it depends on how it is, but it is very elemental. And at the same time, the cost of these things radically going down, things automatically come together. And so it's the question of bringing it together and seeing that it's, uh, and frankly, to me, it's almost surreal. But if it is like a country like Bangladesh, everybody knows it's one of the lowest income countries. Um, there, right now, we have 110 million phones. And when I started, it had, a uh, quarter million fixed phones, okay? So it's a really a profound change, <laughs> to, know, to say the least, yeah. Now, I, I wonder if you could speak to the barriers to entrepreneurial innovation in developing economies. You've spoken very eloquently about the power yeah. of enterprise in developing economies. What do you see, what have been the, the barriers, the legacy barriers? Yeah. All, all innovations. I think human beings cannot radically absorb something completely radically new. It's hard, okay. So uh, similarly, innovations has to ride on other things, okay. So for instance, I, there were a lot of things I sorted out in my head and I said, this is why I'm talking about these insights. And I said, this is what gave me the resilience, the patience to try it because I believed in those insights. Uh, and those insights were logical and made sense to me. But there are actual practical problems, okay? And perhaps you're asking about that. But one of those practical problems is lack of other things. So for example, let's say I bring a good car, but without the highway, I cannot drive the car, okay? So internet, for example, in those same early 1990s, internet were spreading in this country very rapidly. It was very easy to notice. Um, so people already had computers, they had modem, they had telephone lines, they could easily call up something and internet was spreading. But the real problem in poor countries is that you don't have those other infrastructures. Now because of colonialism uh, and subsequent aid-driven, state-driven development, central, uh, centralized planning, even if it's not a communist country, 
tend to be the case. It is tend, even in India, you'll see different states, and within those states, there is central. And so usual pattern in these countries are one central city, often being um, supporting a big in, um, bureaucratic infrastructure, and vast parts of rural areas, uh, relatively underdeveloped with no infrastructure. And what happens, it creates a vicious cycle. Because, because the infrastructures are there, everybody develops things within that area. Okay? So even if you want to start something, you don't want to go out in the rural areas and uh, not have your children go to good schools. So you kind of avoid that. Okay? But this case, here is the problem. I knew through Moore's law and through the Adam Smith thing that this is ultimately useful because it's Moore's law would say it would, it would be viable everywhere. And Adam Smith said it would be useful everywhere. Okay? So then the problem is that how can I break that vicious cycle? Because I, too, do not have engineers to go out in the rural where there is nothing, or there is no lack of electricity, all these problems. And this is why I try to latch on to another organization that may have some infrastructure. And this is why I went to microcredit programs. And somehow, Bangladesh was blessed with good microcredit programs. And Grameen Bank, for instance, had um, 1,000 branches. I thought, oh, maybe I could put the cell towers over there. And this is why, by the way, our name has become, in their honor, Grameen Phone. Okay. But my original idea was Gonophone, which means phones for the masses. Uh -huh. And the daring, see, because I'm bringing these insights, because that is how I projected it will be feasible. Because I was talking about phone for the masses in a poor country when only 1% of Americans had phone, mobile phones in the days I, I started this process. Okay. So, but again, I was basing myself on those insights. Okay. But coming back to this, this is why I try to, the, one of the problems you're talking about is the ecology being poorer okay, to bring something new. Okay. So if you have, an, let's say Amazon.com is a company that's selling books or other things, but people have credit cards. Well, you can base that on, you need those other infrastructure to bring about a new thing. And this is not a conceptual problem. It's a practical problem that you need to solve. And so Grameen Bank, not only I could find those sites where I could potentially put cell towers and some, some infrastructure to help out that process, but also there were borrowers. And eventually, I developed an idea, and I proposed it to a Grameen Bank, that they would give money to somebody to borrow, uh, borrow a small amount of money, $100, $200, to buy vegetable growing facilities or ducks or chicken. Or so. A typical loan was a cow loan. And so I said, you know, the cell phone could be a cow because somebody could borrow $200 um, instead of a cow, get a phone. And the phone would serve the village, mm -hmm. but it would, pay the pers it would be a business for that person. And that idea was was um, was a little crazy, but it was considered illogical. <laughs> but so the founder of Grameen Bank, Mohammad Yunus, said, "Why don't you see if you can make it happen?" So I quit my job. I went there, and I flew around the world. I got some seed funding from New York, and uh, I faced many rejections. But eventually, I managed to convince the Norwegian telephone company. Huh. And they came. And interestingly, they have never been to Asia before. Wow. <laughs> okay. This is Telenor. So Telenor. Yeah. And they were very reluctant to come. And subsequently, they saw this is a great opportunity. Yeah. And today, they are very big in Asia. Yeah. So I want to I talk about that for a minute. Because the normal view of entrepreneurship in the developing world, that says that that is the view held by most of us in the developed world, right. is that all this great stuff gets invented in the developed world, right. and then it trickles down to right. the, to developing economies. Is are we missing something? Is there a different way to view this? Well, in this case, it somewhat trickled down, yeah. somewhat, but rapidly trickled down mm. because of the Moore's law, which says, which is which is a, only a decade later, the same amount of processing power becomes one two hundred or so. Okay, so you can imagine, even if we throw out all the details, it becomes, hundred dollar becomes one dollar in 10 years. That does go down rapidly. That's one issue, 
Okay, and the other is that it is so fundamentally useful. It's an egalitarian thing. So I was totally wrong in chasing computers. Okay, that's when I realized that no, when I when I saw that connectivity is helpful, I also realized at the same time that it's and Adam Smith and all that is there. But you know, it's a culmination of a lot of things. But the other point is it's egalitarian. Everybody can talk. Okay. And so, in a way, it, there is an irony of all this. The point is, the cell phones are actually computers. So the computers have entered this market in the disguise of a phone. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so, so because the voice communication is the killer app, okay, and everybody can talk. But now, what is happening is that these computers are now that they are there. They're kind of a Trojan horse that can do all sorts of other things. Okay. And so when you say trickle down, yes, but if you look at Telenor's example, yes, typically, a, let's say, a um, Western company goes to Asia. First they go to Hong Kong, Singapore, or Japan, or something. And then they will go to poorer and poorer places. That, would, I would say, is trickle down. Mm -hmm. okay. For whatever reason, maybe because I banged on their door for many times, okay? They somehow came to Bangladesh, okay, before they went to any other uh, Asian country, okay. And frankly, it took them a few years. They may not admit it now, but it took them a few years. To, uh, there were some very good people who did this, but what I'm trying to and it got endorsement from the top of Telenor. But I personally think it, they thought it's a good thing to do, okay. Socially. Better. Socially speaking, yeah. okay. But they had some, officially some uh, motivation to make money, but they also thought it's a good thing to do. After all, Norway was the poorest Western European country. And now they, they are things, they have developed very well and fast. After World War II, mm -hmm. Norway was the poorest country in Western Europe, okay. Now, by the way, it's a very expensive place to go. <laughs> okay. So what I'm saying is they, may, they may have had a little bit of that mindset. They have seen their own country develop. So they came, and after four or five years, they saw this is indeed becoming very profitable. And so now they have close to 200 million subscribers in Asia. So Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Myanmar, they had gone to Thailand, Malaysia, etc. But the bottom line is, what is an interesting thing that has evolved, not necessarily I saw it all, that they, the Western world is providing an innovation, but the so-called low-income country is providing a market. And I think that's a very healthy dovetail arrangement, interests of both worlds. And that is an interesting model that uh, American business schools should look at. And so it's not, and what I like about it, there's another aspect of it that is interesting. It's not necessarily selling um, consumer goods, okay? Again, consumer goods have their own good purposes. But the point is, this is empowering people. So somebody is spending, let's say, two pennies to make a phone call, and is saving him a quarter worth of time, then he is advancing by 23 cents. Okay, so these people are actually advancing. So I personally think that the cell phone revolution in Bangladesh is at least producing, I can show some back of the envelope calculation, uh, at least producing $20 billion a year, to say the least, okay? Because it's simply millions of people if more upper, uh, efficient. So what I'm trying to say, if we have productivity tools supplied by Western innovations, then let the innovators make money and let the low-income people provide the market, but they also advance. Yeah. Both are advancing, yeah. okay? Today, I would say that Bangladesh is giving uh, more aid to Norway through dividends than uh, Norway might be giving some aid to Bangladesh. And you know, this is, um, I think that's the way it should be. I mean, we are a bigger country. Uh, we are a warm, bigger country. They are a small, cold country. <laughs> and I think it's a perfectly good arrangement. <laughs> so interesting. So you're saying something actually quite profound. I think, again, we would often characterize impact entrepreneurship right. as people want to do good in the world. Right. They want to use entrepreneurship and enterprise as the as the vehicle. You're saying something slightly different, which is that in some cases, pure greed 
actually is 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 fine. That yeah. that in fact some of these opportunities are exceptionally valuable economic opportunities. I think so. Yeah. But again, we can restrain ourselves with our conscience. Okay. But remember, the ultimate restraint comes from people. So sometimes we are may we may restrain ourselves through our own internal police and say, oh, I won't go there, and I will restrain my greed. But the, as people become more empowered through economic uh, wherewithal, they are also able to create more checks and balances. So ultimately, it is a good thing. But what I'm also trying to say is that if we find fantastic innovations okay, that are empowering at the bottom, then those innovations are to be embraced and people advance this way. And remember another thing, this kind of capital, we're not talking about Marxist worries. We're not talking about a big factory where some capitalist may potentially, quote unquote, exploit people. We're talking about people simply uh, becoming more efficient with their fellow citizens, okay? And as a result, all the value they create often accrue to them themselves, okay? And at the same time, there's a viable business the business makes billions of dollars in revenues and very good dividends, okay? So, but this can be a model for other kinds of innovations that are perfectly in sync with each other's needs through innovation. But there's another, one other issue. Remember, cell phone was not invented for the poor countries, okay? So, too much planning is not necessarily necessary, okay? It was an unintended consequence. What I'm saying is that we need to go into the reservoir of various innovations we have in, this, in the first world and pick out those that we can tweak and make it available for uh, lower income people. And their income automatically rising is, is uh, then they can buy things from the Western world more even, not just the phones. They can buy generators, they can buy other things. So what I'm trying to say, that what is really necessary is, remember, the two things that are already existing in, on the ground, two things. One, normal human desire to improve your lives. That desire is very much a, has a role in this, because without that, they wouldn't use the phone. That's one, okay. The other is there is entrepreneurial energy. Both of these are often squandered if these tools are not found. With the tools, both can be unleashed. I, I want to I turn our attention to those young people who are in developing economies. Right. We're taking very much the perspective, here we are saying in the United right. States, talking right. about entrepreneurship in a developing right. economy. Well, I want to close by, by speaking to our audience that's outside sure. the United States, outside the developed world. What advice would you give to a young entrepreneur sure. who's growing up in Bangladesh or Pakistan? Or, right. or, my my yeah. own example is, is itself could be followed. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm, sh I'm not trying to sell myself, but sure. what I'm trying to say yeah. is that I can, um, I'm, I'm more authority on myself. <laughs> the, point is, the point is, I got an education in the West. That's one. Uh -huh. okay. And therefore, I was informed. Okay. I, and I, I tried to think clearly of what is necessary. Okay. That's, those are one. But nowadays, that is easier than when I tried to educate myself. There was no internet, for example. So now you can even sit in Pakistan and learn some of these things. That's one. The other point is that it's um, uh, that that you don't uh, you could remember I was saying you need one thing to get to the other thing. Remember, uh, let me show you one aspect of that: the fact that cell phones now exist through my work or other people's work. Then that should make their lives a little bit easier and get the information. You can also read the internet through the smartphone now, as an example. So. So you can get a lot of things that didn't exist before, but it's always important to get an education, to think clearly, and think about things that might be available in the West that can be adapted in the, in the, in the lower income countries. But again, there may be other ways of solving problems, but this is the one I found to be um, profoundly transformative, and also things can hang together around that kind of economic interest dovetailing. Okay, well, thank you so much. It was so interesting and inspiring. Thank you, Iqbal. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you.